be here. Uh, today, I'm actually going to change the topic a little bit of uh, what I want to talk to you about today. It's not so much what's wrong with development models as such, but more about the way we think about development. And I want to challenge all of you in that sense, because I think we all have a role to play, either directly or indirectly. And that starts with how we think about development personally, uh, and how we relate to the people around us. So we're in Tanzania, and we Tanzanians are famous for kind of being in love with our first president. And we kind of joke amongst, about, amongst ourselves and uh, our neighbors in the regions will tell you that you know, we always quote Nyerere. So I thought I'd get that one out the way and you can see that either side of you. And I haven't just quoted that because I'm Tanzanian and I'm proud to be so and you know, for all the other reasons I've listed. But I actually think this quote, or if you're looking on that side, encapsulates what it is I believe about development. You can't develop someone else. You, know, like you can't teach someone else to ride a bicycle. You can't teach them to do better. You can teach them how they might go about it. But they then have to go through that process themselves. You can assist them, you can help them, you can advise them, you can guide them, but ultimately, they have to do that for themselves. Just like if you prepare for your exams, your teachers are there to guide you. They're not going to sit those exams for you. Ultimately, you have to do that for yourself in order for you to grow and to develop. And that's the core principle of what I really want to get across today. Uh, so I want to start off by telling you a little bit about myself and why I've been grappling with this problem, which is something I still work with uh, today in my job and generally in the way I see the world. So, start out. So I was born in, you know, way, way, way back when, in 1985. You know, when Mad Max was Mel Gibson, Back to the Future was really cool, and look at those outfits and that hair. You know, it hits like night shift. Seriously, no one? Take on me? No one? Uh, look it up later, guys. What you had back then was the world coming together. Right? My father is a Tanzanian, he's an engineer, old school, very traditional, go to school, do well, find a job. My mother is a Norwegian, worked for the Norwegian government, first woman in her family to get an education, and saw the world very differently. Now, you have one parent coming from arguably the richest country in the world at the time, and one coming from possibly one of the poorest countries in the world. So this discussion about what is development, what is a good life, what's the way to do things properly, made for very interesting dinners. Like my house was not exactly quiet. But this is development. What is the best way to live? How do you go about getting better and improving? And all these kinds of things that we're challenged with when we talk about making the world a better place or contributing to your community, to your society, to your family, to yourself. These have always been, at least for me, this kind of duality between the rich did it, this is the way to do it, and the other side that says, well, that worked for you, but we need to figure this out for ourselves. And there's always been this kind of duality between, you know, do you develop, are you developed, are we developing, are we underdeveloped, and so on. And I don't even know which one I am because, you know, I'm a product of both. So one of the things that you will very often see is this, and I'm, I'm really sorry for having to show you a graph, it's kind of like mandatory to see like I know what I'm talking about. But what you'll see in this graph, and it's very important because it's a very simplistic argument that, okay, yes, we'll tell you there is a difference, but it won't tell you why that difference is. So the red line looks at Southeast Asia, right? And what you'll see is in 1960, Sub-Saharan Africa, what we call Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia and the Pacific were basically just as poor as each other, at least measured by what we call GDP. Towards the 70s, it started growing together, and then all of a sudden, there's this huge split, right? And you see that Africa, on average, we've stayed relatively poor, and Asia has taken off. And the simplistic argument is that Asia did something right, and we did something wrong, or just didn't do the right thing. And if only, we would be more like them, or at least learn from them and do what they did, because clearly something has gone wrong here, right? But it won't why. It won't tell you how. It won't tell you what the cost of raising that income was. And my worry is that if we blindly follow these ideas of measuring development just through income, we really lose the of what development, at least in my mind, should be. So, before we go further with this, like, you know, boring mathematical stuff, I'll tell you what I think development is, right? I walk around in Dar es Salaam, and there's no secret there's poverty here. Like there's no secret, there's poverty in 
you know, parts of London, parts of Toronto, wherever in the world you come from. But for me, development is just very simple things. It's that you have a decent life and you have a dignified life. And once you break it to something that simple, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how much you earn, as long as you're satisfied in doing it and contributing to your community. And that doesn't necessarily mean, right? We just had a great performance in front of us. That's a contribution to you. That is something you're privileged to witness, to enjoy, right? Now, you can compensate an artist for it, they can go about making more art and so on, but it is part of enriching your life that you have this diversity of experiences. Artists, techies, sports. How many of you like sports in here at least? Okay, now I can see. Not well, enough of you. But these are all things that a developed community has, a developed community shares. It's not just how much money they have, you see. And I think graphs like this force us to think in very narrow terms, not think the broader picture of what that might mean. And therefore, and I, you know, I don't want to throw my dad under the bus or anything because he did support me. But this idea that success can only be measured in a certain way, through certain degrees, through certain activities, is really dangerous and I think narrows what makes us human and what makes us rich. Right? So back to the boring stuff. So Asia really is famous for four countries that are called the four Asian tigers. Right? These are South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and what we call Taiwan, depending on where in the world you are. Now all of these have developed, right, or at least have become rich, at different costs and through different means and different mechanisms. Right? If I were to ask you, did they all do the same thing? Anyone know? No? So I'll take the example of South Korea. These guys basically industrialized through just destroying the environment, and they're now paying for that. Is that something you really want to do? Right? Not just here in Dar es Salaam or in Tanzania, but anywhere. Do you want to sacrifice? being able to walk in the park? Do you want to sacrifice being able to breathe clean air? No. And the problem is that we think it, of development in a linear way. You know, input A, process B, outcome C. Right? It's not going to work. No two countries anywhere in history have ever developed in the same way. But these are not the things we tend to talk about when we talk about development. It's always, we need to be like, we need to do as, you know, we need to copy them. And here in Tanzania, at least, we have a very sickening expression that actually depresses me. Right? It, in Swahili, you know, when someone does something odd on the streets, and those of you who live here will, will, will have heard, Ayulim Swahili. Right? You, you chuckle. Right? You, it, in English, it's, you know, that guy is a, is a Swahili. Right? So what? Like, why do we attribute negative things, hopelessness, idiocy, simplicity, stupidity, with being Swahili? Right? If we, if we then broaden that, say, okay, Swahilis are what we broadly say Tanzanians are. It's much more mixed up, but it's what the slang is for. What we're essentially saying is we are hopeless. Being like us is hopeless. It's pointless. It's bad. It's negative. And we've made development something else. We need to be like them. It's a foreign concept. And I have, I have, wor I have a problem with this. Because if you extend that kind of thought to what we learned about Asia, you know, we need to be like Asia, or like Europe, or like someone else. And we are ashamed to be ourselves, both as a community, as a society, but ultimately as individuals as well. And that bothers me. So, as I said, it's not so much the model, it's the way of what development is that I really want to hammer home today. And to illustrate this, these four countries that you see here are known as the, you know, the Asian tigers. And what you might see if you're interested in studying development like I did, we can talk about that later, is you want to ask yourself, will Africa be you know, Asian tigers? Or are we going to be African lions and whatever that means? And I like this picture because unlike most other areas, development, well, unlike, say, the sciences, unlike what you might believe if you read even economic textbooks, we don't know what development in Africa will look like. We don't know ultimately where it will end up. So how can we simplistically say process A equals outcome B and then go over and over and over? And if we leave this to so-called experts, that's what they will keep telling us. Rather than us going around and saying, hmm, what do I need? What bothers me? What can I do about it? What do these experts know that might be able to help me? 
which is the way I think we need to approach this, which is why I want to challenge the way that we think about development, so that we can then be empowered to actually go and do something about it on our own terms. Right? But this idea of being like the other is very important. Right? And now we get to the mandatory boring stuff. So, the very old looking picture is an American philosopher called William James. Right? You won't probably come across him, but in 1888, he comes up with what's called the as-if principle. Right? How many of you have heard, you know, fake it till you make it? Right? It's this idea that if you want to be, you act like that something until you eventually become that something. Right? And, I, and I think there is something important to having role models, mimicking them if you can, or making it work for you, but you will never quite be exactly that. Right? And a really good example of this, in economics at least, was put forward by Milton Friedman. Right? If you imagine, do you, does anyone here play billiards or pool or snooker? Yeah? Theoretically, you can turn a snooker game into a, a bunch of geometry quizzes, right? You should be able to figure out exactly where every single ball will end up depending on how you hit and how you strike. And therefore, be able to predict what happens with a certain input in terms of what will happen on the field. Right? How many of you are good at snooker? You can, be, you can be honest with me, it's fine. Not a lot of hands, it's a bit worrying. But the whole point, what makes a game like snooker or sport in general, or life generally, interesting is that, yes, we have an idea of what's going to happen, and we have a certain aim of what we want, but we don't quite know what's going to happen, and that's a good thing, that's exciting. It can be dangerous, might not be a very nice thing, but at least that's what keeps us going. Right? So, if you take this snooker example, it means that it do, it's not enough to act as if you were something else in order to succeed. You have to go beyond that. It'll only take you a certain way, after which you have to realign. So, in the snooker example, you'll play your ball, the table shifts. You then recalculate and try again. Right? And this is how development works, at least in my opinion, and how it should work. We will make mistakes, but we shouldn't be afraid of that. We shouldn't be looking for simple solutions. We shouldn't be outsourcing this and giving that Right? That's our job. That's what makes us a community. It's how we come together to get the things we feel are important. And if you come down to that principle and that way of looking at development, then you don't sit and model and try to you know, become that other. You start to focus on what's important to you and how do you make that happen around you. I think fundamentally, that is what needs to shift about development. We shouldn't look at it as an eventuality. We shouldn't look at it as something that someone else will do. Like, I don't even think we should think about it as development, right? You have a role to play in the community you come from because your community is you plus the person next to you. That person's husband or wife, that person's children, grandparents. That is your community. Everything you do and everything they do impacts you and you impact upon them. And so what you need to do is figure out what works for you, what is for you, and ultimately, if everyone does that, it'll add up and you will have this development that you want. Granted, certain things need to have brought a consensus, and we just saw that in the previous video. But if we ultimately focus on what we feel is right, we will end up doing what we think is right, and therefore, I believe, you will end up developing in the right way. And if we all collectively do